Hey everybody and welcome to the latest episode of No Limits with Christoph and Luke, episode 19. It's just the two of us again this week. Uh, we had our fantastic guest, Krishna, for the last couple of weeks. But uh, before we hit the record button, Christoph was just telling me how much he's missed me while I've been away. That's quite sweet, isn't it? It's the sweetest. What is my life without you, Luke? It is not much. It does not add, the numbers don't add up. Getting out of bed is harder. Uh, so yes, just the two of us. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I love talking to uh, to Krishna, and I thought those two episodes uh, regarding the Indian and how the investing landscape there looks were really meaningful, really insightful. It was fun doing an interview style. I think we got we got lucky with our guest there. Like he was super knowledgeable um, about like what's happening in India and making some really big prognostications about like the next 10 years of fascinating conversation. Like if you didn't check it out, go listen to the last two episodes of No Limit, right? If you're interested in investing in India now or in the future, like some really, really good background on what's happening out there. And I personally invested a teeny, teeny, tiny bit in one of the India ETFs. I don't even, I think it's I-N-D-Y. It sounds like India must be great, you know, but I did not. <laughs> just, 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 just to be clear, I did not do much, much thorough research into looking uh, deeply into what this thing holds. The fact that it was an India ETF was enough to, to put a little starter seed in the, to plant a seed in the ground. I am more confident in the probabilities that investing in India around now will be similar-ish in outlook to investing in a Google in 2000. Before Google becomes a verb, that's the time to invest if you believe that the infrastructure is in place. Like for me, Krishna gave us a couple of factoids that uh, really make that a compelling thesis. Um, and I do hope you've bought an India index, not some like motor racing company with Indy. But, uh, but Krishna's, uh, Krishna, like he told us, manufacturing is set to triple 3x by 2031 because of something called the Production Linked Incentive Scheme. That's pretty incredible. Uh, and at the same time, India's average income per capita is going to double by the end of this decade. Oh, and demographics, right? 70% of the population are going to be in the workforce by the end of this decade. So like we're quite early on this and the next seven years are going to be explosive in terms of um, what companies are doing in that part of the world. And the thing I want to double down on too is the, the easy comparison for me here, Luke, is Japan and India. In Japan, you have an aging workforce mm -hmm. and a population crisis, impending population crisis. In India, you have the opposite you have an entire generation now connected to the internet about to, in the age of AI, go online. And what that, in the world's most populous country. Some, some investors argue from the perspective of demographics. And if that's your perspective here, there's no better setup than India. Yeah, well, I'm going to be out there from Thursday this week, so I'll be able to give you an on-the-ground perspective, albeit one based on just a couple of lunches and dinners with a bunch of friends, but I'll be asking them about uh, what's happening in the investing world out there. Oh, I can't wait to, to hear what you what you discover and what you feel. You know, on-the-ground sensibility matters so much, so please send the photos and you got give us the goods. So what I was saying so, earlier about missing you, sorry, we got uh, uh, ahead of ourselves, the other thing that makes me miss you even more is because you are our uh, resident James Bond, always in some casino, always drinking some martini, <laughs> always under some palm exotic palm tree, some some ham. You know, like where in the world is Luke? And I believe you were in Montenegro doing a long bike tour. You may not have enjoyed the motorcycle tour. It was fantastic, but uh, only for enthusiasts. My buddies did about four and a half thousand kilometers. They rode from London, but I cheated and met them in Croatia. Uh, I did best part of 2000 kilometers myself over the course of about four days. Um, and we did like all of Croatia, including a bunch of the islands. We did uh, a lot of Bosnia, nearly got to Serbia, but the rain was just ferocious. So we turned mm -hmm. back uh, and we did Montenegro. Uh, great fun. Amazing. Well, good, good to see your, your sparkling blues again, Luke. 
<laughs> they're so. blue, right? Your eyes, they're blue or gray? Uh, it's very romantic. Green. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. It's low uh, resolution video. Green is your okay. t-shirt. Maybe not. Okay. <laughs> not as wide as your teeth, though. You've just come back from uh, yeah. a cleansing at the dentist. Very good. Yes. Do you want to shout out your fabulous dentist on the pod? Uh, yes. Uh, Jay over at uh, Dr. Kelly's on Speedway and uh, 35th. <laughs> He's a uh, Austin rock and roll legend an old school real guitar player here and uh he he handled my pearly whites with the most gentle care because i'm i'm a mouse i'm 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 a i'm a complete and utter mouse when it comes to dentistry so he got me coming back for many years so props to you jay great stuff thank you jay for uh preserving (laughs) our buddies pearly whites and beautiful voice so luke since we last talked NVIDIA has been a point of conversation for all kinds of reasons. The fundamental one was that their earnings report blew expectations out of the water. And so what you ended up seeing was, my numbers are a little uh, fuzzy, but it was something like they added over $200 in market cap overnight. So that's the thing that was astounding. Mega caps usually don't jump. Tw- what is it? Twenty five percent? Some 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 enormous amount because they're already so big. So that signified that the story on the story level of AI not not only is it real. We know we know it's real from the last couple of months with GPT, but that it's showing up in the numbers, and that it's there's a there there right. And I think it took the market aback the size of the beat and the size of the the revenue reacceleration and and that led to a whole lot of fascinating conflicting views about what to do now and i thought we could talk through what it would mean to sell nvidia at this point to keep holding it and or to buy it at this point I think it's going to be a fascinating discussion for today's pod. Let's um, and let's go a little deeper on this, but maybe we should give a bit of background as well, because you know you and I are both lead advisors with Seven Investing. When you came into the team in I think June 2022, uh, you wanted to pick Nvidia uh, for your own first recommendation, but I had pipped you to the post inadvertently, and I got it in with my first of July recommendation. So apologies for one, because uh, I've not only recommended it once, I've been able to recommend it twice for the service. And both of those recommendations are up more than 100%. And if you want a quick kind of promo for seven investing, if you want to see my recommendations, Christoph's and a bunch of others, several of which are also up 100% in a matter of months, go check out seveninvesting.com slash subscribe right now. We've got a special deal. Our founder, Simon Erickson, has put on for this month only $1. You can go check out everything. Hey, you can go check it out, download the lot for a dollar, and then cancel your sub, right? Go see what's happening there. If you like it, though, recommend you stick around. There's some incredible conversations happening on our Discord. Yeah, don't don't cancel uh, because then you lose, <laughs> a- <laughs> you lose access to to a really fantastic community with with really dedicated investors, and you get access to us piping up on the latest uh, earnings and what to do now questions, and it's just good banter and good community, and you're not alone when you stay. And of course, you have access to all these. What is it? Two hundred. 80 plus reports that that really give you a solid fundamental understanding of a company should you wish to follow up and, and um, start your due diligence from there. Uh, I will say, oh, yeah. Luke, that the NVIDIA episode has confirmed that I am correct in studying the dark arts of jiu-jitsu. Because when I finally get you in in, in the same room, <laughs> I'm gonna te- I'm gonna I'm gonna put some of these methods to the test for for your uh, snatching away Nvidia uh, from me. But what? Th- that's our reality. So you are the uh, the resident Nvidia expert. What did you I guess big picture see and hear from the report? Right. So nothing that surprised me like this was my thesis and the whole thesis was 
um, data center, i.e. all of these like incredibly parallel processing um, GPUs is going to explode because of AI demand. And I think with, you know, many investors have seen that coming for a long time, but I put a stake in the sand back in July and said, this is going to be outsized demand. The market's not expecting it. And here we are. It's now happening. Um, I think I am surprised though at the pace jumping up their demand so quickly in this quarter has taken me by a little by surprise. So, um, totally foresaw where they're going, but the speed they're going at has surprised me. In my thesis is not quite yet showing up, which is long time ago. I don't think people quite understood what I was saying. I was, I was putting forth the notion that two, two things, automotive is coming. So that's still very, very early stages and didn't, didn't materially add much to the thesis, but it's coming. But the other fact is that, is that it's, um, CUDA software system. And I was saying it's, it's, it's kind of a software company. If you really understand the layers that these, that the infrastructure, you'll realize that in order to take advantage of the hardware, you're going to need to take advantage of CUDA's proprietary software system. And that's the magic sauce that will make this an extravagant investment. So that's still to come. And, uh, and the markets rewarded that richly, as you say, like the valuation leaping up over 20%, just on the back of the company's forecasts for its next quarter. Like they, they're expecting to deliver so much more revenue than the market expected. And investing really is all about growth and anticipation of the future. So the market's now thinking, well, heck, if this company can sell so many graphics cards to data center operators around the world, well, if they can sustain that pace, this is what justifies a trillion dollar valuation. Which leads us to our central topic, the what now. And I thought we would divide it into three parts. Do you sell, do you hold, or do you buy? And what do you have to believe if you take each of these routes? I personally owned NVIDIA. I added a whole bunch around 150 per share. And then when it got to approximately 275, so for me, it was like a 60 something percent gain. I looked at it and I thought the sales multiple has really gotten ahead of itself. And I had other opportunities that I want to invest in. So combined, the fact that I had other opportunities plus the rich valuation, I thought this is a good time to sell. In hindsight, that was an error because it went up another $100, $140 per share, right? But the process, so, you know, uh, the, I think the process was sound-ish. One error was that, you know, I was to some extent anchoring in my mind, you know, well, I bought it 150 and it's 270. So that's a fallacy, potentially, right? right? But the thing that worried me more is maybe the PTSD I still have from 2021, where I was an owner of what I thought the world's best businesses without changing fundamentals, selling at very rich valuation. Meanwhile, I'm hearing things like debt crisis and banking crisis and all kinds of very wobbly macro forces. Are we going into rest, recession? All this stuff, right? So that combination of the high PS and the high ratios in general, very, very high. I mean, from before earnings, right? That it was the highest that it's ever been. There's a fine line between being excited in the world moving in a certain direction and being right about that in hype and bubbles. So all these things together, I thought, you know, this is an imperfect science, but I'm going to sell. And you sold out completely. I sold out completely. And with the fingers crossed mentality that I hope it'll drop back down so I could pick the shares up again for cheaper. It has not obviously worked out that way as of this, as of today's recording. But, you know, the thing you don't see is that I did take that money and I did reinvest it in things I think are undervalued. One last thing I'll say here in, in terms of the sell viewpoint, Luke, is I was also operating from the principle trying to be very mindful of 
discerning my love for the business from the stock itself as a general principle. It is true, right, that stocks get overbought and then they correct. So because the market whipsaws from too, too pessimistic, too optimistic. So I did not want to be blind to my love for NVIDIA, the business. And because it's hardware, mostly at, the, at this moment, um, I thought, you know, there and, and it's history. Also, if we think about it, it's NVIDIA has some pretty notorious drops. I took a chance and said, this is a good time to free up some cash. What do you think about the, the, the this sell point, sell viewpoint? Um, my own approach wasn't wildly dissimilar. Um, I, I also opened a position back in July when I first recommended it. Um, and I, I probably, I probably built a 2% position in my portfolio, um, which were, which kind of aligned with, I guess kind of where I start off generally in terms of a company. I think I understand, I believe in the thesis and I'm just going to go watch it for six months and see what happens. And then organically, because of the, really the tremendous run up in the valuation that grew from a two to a nearly four or five percent position. And then when I, when I started seeing around the same point around sort of $275 a couple of weeks ago and and actually what I was looking at, the metric I was looking at mostly was how the company's valued on a price to free cash flow basis. So I think personally, I'm using that as like a really incredibly important metric right now because we might be going into a recession. Companies that are well capitalized, that are profitable, you know, they're generating free cash flow, um, which they can reinvest in their own business. Those are the companies I want in my portfolio right now because it's going to make them a bit more bulletproof if we do go into a really tough macro climate, or which we which we seem to be doing. So um, the, on a price to free cash flow basis, like the company has never really traded much above about 50 times free cash flow, certainly not in the next, the last 10 or 15 years. And suddenly it was at 180 times free cash flow. So, you know, I try not to let valuation drive my investment decisions, but at some point, like reality has to bite. So I didn't sell completely, but I cut my position back fairly substantially. I cut it back to a 2% position again. So I kind of, you know, mm -hmm. effectively sort of took some of those gains off the table. Um, I want to add to my position though. So I'm, I'm kind of, I've, I've done something I'm, I'm tending to do these days with my portfolio, which is I've kind of optimized my, the structure of my portfolio to minimize future regret. So. Like if I've sold kind of half of my position, mm -hmm. if the stock goes down, I'm happy because I'm going to add that money back at a better valuation. And if the stock goes up, I'm happy because I've still got a 2% allocation. It's going to grow from here. So I'm kind of, there's probably no outcome where I've got my head in my hands and I'm sobbing uncontrollably. Yeah. yeah. It, it, you, hindsight, of course, I shouldn't have sold all of it, right? I should have taken a more moderate approach, but that there's also a problem with that you know i it, there is something to be said for taking a distinctive action and you stop torturing yeah. yourself so you know this is maybe i don't know as far as usefulness for our listeners but i i hope the message isn't all answers are correct and yet and yet this is it's always personal to you i think i'll underscore this point it, if i did not have a very clear place for the new money i would not have sold let me right. let me put it that way. So should we come back then to your original question? Like, what do you have to believe to be a buyer today, to be a seller today, or just to be kind of holding on for bare life, you know, not changing anything? Yeah, so I think we covered the sell, the sell point of view. It's overvalued and you should have something to do with your money. The hold, yeah. right, the hold, to talk about that as a respectable option, this to me represents maybe the hardest thing in investing and the thing that has burned me more times than I can count. I would already be retired like Luke if I followed this middle principle, which is when you find a company that is at the edge of the world, where the world is going and it's succeeding, it does not matter what the market is doing. Put your hands, take your hands, slide them firmly, firmly under butt cheeks, <laughs> and then just 
and then just lean back and press in and do nothing. Just do nothing. Had I done this with, I, I hate being a, 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 you know, I hate, th this is so painful to, <laughs> to talk about for the 20th time, but I'm trying to give myself a pep talk. You know, had I done that with Netflix and the Apple and the Amazon and Tesla and now Nvidia, right? I would be retired, but instead, no, I did not hold because valuation, because blah, 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 blah. You always have the reasons to do something, right? right. And that's what's maddening sometimes in investing the game plan, the, the view, the worldview that all you have to do is nothing is the hardest medicine to actually take, right? And carry forth because you have all these good reasons, to, to not do nothing. Yeah. So I find it incredibly persuasive to, you know, to people who are in uh, NVIDIA today. Yeah. And not, not to uh, sort of boil that point to death, but like any action you take costs you money, whether you're buying or selling. Um, like you're paying the spread, like the difference between the buy and the sell price. For me, as a UK investor, you know, using a particular kind of tax efficient account, I'm paying the FX twice, like when I buy and I sell, because I have to settle into sterling. So that's a strong incentive to do nothing for me. Mm -hmm. um, I have to really believe something to make a change. Um, and it plays into that view of the coffee can portfolio. You know, this idea that you buy great quality companies and then just ignore them for like multiple decades. And one of those uh, is very likely, if they're good quality companies, to grow such an enormous amount it'll outweigh the losses, even if everything else went to zero. It's it's a really important strategy to take seriously. You'll hear critics of it, buy and hold is dead, long-term investing is dead, who knows what will happen in the age of AI and, and market gyrations and algos and whatnot. I am yeah. still persuaded that out of the three options, the hold option is the simplest easiest stupidest in a way and yet and yet probably the one that will out hustle the other two the moving in and out trying to time things and it's hard it's so hard to do uh and and maybe i'll add that this cuts both ways to speak to uh, another one of our seven recommendations I guess in general, I say it's a very popular cybersecurity firm. And I firmly believe in that business, the model, the runway, and so forth. And so when the valuations got overextended in 2020, 21, I knew they were overextended and I th thought I should sell, but I wanted to honor this hold principle. So what happened? They, the, the share prices plummeted massively the correct decision would have been to sell but that's i think one again hindsight bias and two the story's not over 10 years from now if i extend the runway the pro the the hold will probably have been the correct decision anyway so so let's let's take that um 10 years from now and apply it to like what do you have to believe to be a buyer of nvidia today because I think that there is a um, there is a, a strong argument to be made to be buying Nvidia at a trillion dollar market cap. Um, like if you're a young investor, just one example, you know, maybe you've got your own. If you're in your twenties and um, you're you know you're buying with a 20, 30 year perspective, and if you genuinely believe that this company is not only benefiting from the tailwind of AI. Um, which you could argue perhaps is fully priced in today, but their growth is going to continue to compound for years and years and years to come. But you also buy into you know, your thesis on automotive, the fact that the NVIDIA drive platform is essentially going to be the brains and the, the arms and legs of every autonomous vehicle that's not like Waymo or Tesla or perhaps BYD, or I think even though BYD may be partnered with NVIDIA too. Um, you know, there are many other legs to this stool. And so if you just firmly believe that and you're willing to sweat some drawdowns, maybe coffee can it for 10 years, I think you could legitimately buy this company today and uh, as part of a basket of high growth tech stocks and just forget about it for 10 years and you'll probably make out very well. 
especially if you add the practice of dollar cost averaging so that psychologically what you think to yourself is I did not put all my money all at once into the stock at this price because I know it's expensive. Rather, what I did is I took some of my money, I bought it at this expensive point, and therefore, if it draw, if it goes up, great, I'm rich or I'm, <laughs> I'm richer. But if it goes down, that's great. I get to deploy more of my capital at a better value point and have more shares. Oh, it went down again. Great. I get to have even more. So the systematic spreading out your investments makes holding over the long term even easier. I think people get in trouble when they get overexcited by the stock. There's lots of reasons to be very excited about NVIDIA. They think, okay, I buy I buy what Luke here is selling. That I buy the story, I buy the thesis. I know it's expensive, but 10 years, it's going to be even better. But then what happens to your mind when a year from now, it drops 35% and you you have no cash left and it was the majority of your portfolio. There are all kinds of reasons, ways in which over enthusiasm in one shot will get you in trouble. So yeah. you got you got to practice all those really good portfolio management disciplines about being diversified and, you know, not investing with money that you think you're going to need in the next five years, 10 years. But if you can get those things right and you can kind of, let your brain be the master of your heart, kind of control your emotions when things go up, down or sideways. Well, I mean, those are the keys to building wealth over the long time in the stock market. The one, uh, the one specific NVIDIA question I have for you, Luke, in support of the buy thesis, do you think other big time players in the AI space, so let's name Google, let's name Apple potentially, let's name Tesla. Do you think that, well, knowing that they're working on AI manufacturing and they have their own teams and capabilities, is there danger for the competition to eat away at NVIDIA's lead that the future, in other words, might be overly rosy from today's vantage? Um, and if you come check out at seven investing you'll get to watch my two deep dive videos on this company and i think i fielded that exact question on one of them i do check out the deep dives if you come join one dollar this month seveninvesting.com slash subscribe um and especially check out the deep dives because in the last three or four um christoph has had to face an absolute brutal onslaught from anirban and he's done a fantastic job every time so that's like that's worth your dollar just for the comedy value of, uh, of seeing those discussions go down but when i fielded this question in i think my most recent deep dive my view there was like sure there are other companies manufacturing their own chips like the ones that come to mind are google um amazon uh i think facebook um but in a massively growing market, right? There doesn't have to be one winner. And if you're not using infrastructure from those companies, like NVIDIA are building their own data centers, they're also supplying all of those users. If you want to be running CUDA, like the software architecture that you described just now, Christoph, which is really frankly the, the best, the highest performance way of running parallelized processing, then you need NVIDIA's kit. To run all that stuff so even though google and amazon everybody else is going to be selling more of their own chips well nvidia is going to be selling more of theirs at the same time and a rising tide lifts all boats and i think it's hard to argue today that nvidia aren't the uh, the biggest battleship on the ocean of ai hardware i buy that yeah so so maybe in summary let's say that each of these three decisions, sell, hold, and buy, has a lot going for it. And it's it ends up being very specific to your own time frame, your own style, and as I like to say, the game you're playing. So this is if there's something practical you could get get from this, it's become aware or more aware of the kind of game you are playing and then settle into that lane and trust the process if you're willing to be more nimble 
or if you you're you're trying to time things and be a, a trade have trader like mentality, sell. If you are long term, hold. If you are thinking really broad, really deep into the future, start buying. Yep, absolutely. And and there's countless other factors that will come into that decision making too. Not the least of which is how old you are, frankly, as an investor, how much time you expect to have in the market, how much of your net assets are being invested, um, and all the other things you might be planning to do, like buy a house, have a kid. So you've got to factor all this stuff in. Oh, and not to mention, you know, your risk tolerance and just kind of uh, how much investing is kind of exciting you or terrifying you. And those are both quite unhelpful emotions. Exciting you is perhaps just as bad as being terrified about what's going on. Um, if anybody tells you what to do, well, they're probably giving you bad advice. Um, you really, this is why to be an individual investor, you've got to put the work in, you've got to understand yourself and you've got to know why you're buying the companies you're buying and how your portfolio construction is oriented to like your own life plan. So that's, that's really right. what seven investing is all about, giving you those building blocks so that you can kind of figure out the right answer for you. That's right, because this is not financial advice. What we provide you is are frameworks through which to better make decisions for yourself. Speaking of risks, though, Luke, uh, I was told by my mama that I have to watch a movie. She was so excited about this one movie that she saw. And then I saw maybe it was on your Twitters or maybe it was Slack. I can't remember. Uh, you saw the same movie and you gave it the uh, two, two uh, tequila lightning bolts, uh, <laughs> Tesla tequila bolts uh, up. And so I watched it the other night and it was one of them. It was such an enjoyable film. What are we talking about here? Talk about uh, Ben Affleck's latest um, Air, which is the story of uh, Nike signing Michael Jordan um, back in the 80s to really essentially sort of lead the company to greatness and really make Nike what it is today, this kind of branding powerhouse in the world of sports retail. So what do you see in it that can make someone a better investor? Uh, and I don't want to spoil the movie. So uh, like, if you haven't seen the movie, go watch it. Let's try and avoid spoilers. Uh, although, oh, it's you mean, like, yeah, Mike, Michael yeah. Jordan <laughs> does okay. He does okay. Yeah, like, yeah. It's, you it's might a, have heard of him. Yeah. yeah, it's a gamble. Basically, the structure of the plot is it's a gamble on, uh, you know, who should Nike sign? Uh, they're struggling in the yeah. shoe industry. They're the third, I think, 17% of the market. They're getting their butts kicked by Adidas and Converse. Uh, there's this up and comer named Michael Jordan. Should they take a risk on this guy? So if you miss the Jordan era, it turns out he did okay. So, uh, so maybe the biggest lesson, I wouldn't say just an investing lesson, like a life lesson I took away from this. Um, it's about using your gut instinct when you know something's right, trusting your gut, but also like infusing that with experience and data to make a good decision. And, um, the, you know, the main protagonist in the movie, Sonny Vaccaro, who's kind of the, um, the sports expert on the basketball world. And the fact that he kind of lives and breathes this industry goes to all like the, the, the college games really understands the up and coming players and He's got that gut instinct, but it's backed up by like tons of data. He didn't have spreadsheets in those days, but just watching like tons of videos of games and making notes to try and make like the best decision uh, for his company. And in fact, that was the scene that I really marveled at. One of them is this is in the spoiler. Matt Damon is uh, Matt Damon's character is looking at the highlight of Jordan hitting the winning shot of his uh, NCAA tournament and seeing something in that shot that I literally, I, as the watcher of the movie could not see. And I, and I thought to myself as I'm watching, I'm like, wait, what's he seeing? Because it looked fairly ordinary ish. And then he, in the film, he breaks down what he saw that made it extraordinary. And I think that Luke, that is such an essential point you're bringing up 
gut instincts, maybe. I mean, yeah, I have a lot of gut instincts at the poker table and uh, at the roulette wheel. <laughs> <laughs> right but it's very different game when you've also put in so much time and you can see verifiably so some data evidence that okay this instinct is backed up by experience then then you have a, a, a path to follow as an investor it's cool it's a it's a good um, reminder about the power of hard work, basically. Um, and, you know, our brains are this mushy, incredible thing, but they seem to be able to do all this kind of weird thinking in the background. And you kind of an idea will come to you, but sometimes it's come to you be because of, you know, thousands of hours of just absorbing what's happening around you. And that can feel like mm. gut instinct, but it could be quite scientific. But I try and be quite objective like i try and write down my thesis for example mm -hmm. whenever i make a trade if i buy or sell something trim something or add to something kind of record why that was because i'm trying to improve that instinct figure out where i've made errors how about you what was your uh, biggest kind of takeaway from the movie i love the scene this is not a big takeaway from the movie per se but i love the scene where Matt Damon's character decides to drive down to the Jordans' house because that to me is emblematic of the I'm breaking some rules here. I'm going outside my agent's purview. It's surprising. It's it's kind of unconventional, maybe a little bit edgy. But I, like I like to say, to really be successful in, in investing, you have to be contrarian to a certain degree. Because if you're not, you will at best have average returns. And at worst, you're too late. And so my own style, as some people in our seven investing community have recently noted, they're, 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 if they're drawn to my style, which I think some people are, what they're sensing is that I like playing more and more into a situation where the the contrary move, where the critiques and the downside to the company is actually more visible and prevalent than the upside. And so it makes it very difficult. It really makes it hard to trust your own due diligence and process when very smart people with very rational reasons are telling you you're wrong because of X, Y, and Z. And I think that's what I saw in that um, in that scene. They, Matt Damon knew that if they were to present in the typical corporate fashion, that they would be playing into the their opponent's game, and that they, as the underdog, were not going to win that game. So how do you do? How do you become contrarian? Well, you ride. You know, you you meet Mrs. Michael Jordan, you know, in person, and you charm them with your sincerity, and lo and behold. I think there's another good example of breaking the rules in the movie, too, um, where uh, just to distinguish the product, they Nike agreed that they would basically pay the fine for uh, having like an illegal color on the shoe, like not enough white on the shoe, and to make the product stand out and really appeal to their target consumer. And they were happy to pay like the $5,000 fine per game for Michael to wear these illegal shoes because they knew they were going to make bank by selling, well, what turns out to be hundreds of millions of dollars worth of shoes just in the first year. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that is thinking really unconventionally outside the box. You see the big picture and it's, you know, it's, it's hard to do. Luke, I kind of teased you a little bit about, uh, Nike, the company, because I think we were having a conversation somewhere about innovative companies. Was it you that put this poll up on Twitter? I think uh, somebody else did. Might be the Chit Chat Money guys. They posted the 50 most innovative companies in the world. And you chat right, Nike being That's on That's right. Yeah. 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 And I was curious because I this may be a good moment to help us better understand how on in one way Nike does in fact make shoes and they've been doing it for a long time now so in when i 
when I think innovation, you know, I do think Tesla and Nvidia and Apple because they're bringing new things that did not exist and making them. But I think you pushed back a little bit on Nike as a company that has innovation. How so? Yeah, well, I suppose actually, if I just look at uh, what my wife wears when she goes running, right? She's she's got her treasured pair of Nike Zoom Alpha Fly uh, running shoes, which were the ones that um, Kipchoge broke the two-hour marathon record in. Um, like, there's just a ton of science. Like all this R and D spend that Nike invest isn't spent on nothing. They've got this incredible kind of sports science. Uh, utility and and people and they've built some really groundbreaking products that are letting athletes essentially kind of push the bounds of what everyone thought was possible um and then not only are there is their kind of footwear cutting edge um i think from memory like nike land in roblox like uh in the metaverse i know that stuff didn't really come to anything but they're out there kind of experimenting with the stuff and having like virtual stores in the metaverse um uh they bought a company called artifact a while back a couple of years ago um to, to sell kind of digital merchandise so you know they're not so resting on their laurels just thinking oh we're selling uh, we're selling shoes and bags and tennis rackets or whatever right they're uh they're really experimenting um so you're right you know they're not a they're not a tesla or a spacex but they're doing some pretty innovative things in their lane and you could see that, right? The movie, the structure of the movie shows us clips of their core principles, like break the rules. And actually, some of them are pretty, pretty enticing. Uh, they seem to be a company grounded in principle and trying to live from those principles. And it seems like good things happen when you do that, at least in Nike's case, for sure. And rock solid yeah. fundamentals, right? But arguably wildly overvalued NVIDIA, actually just a very solid like fundamentally strong company generating free cash flow and uh, operating this kind of global retail machine with an incredible brand, like the number one brand in the world for eight plus years, I think now. So you want to talk about one more uh, uh, risk taker who, based on uh, our time of recording, which is Monday, June 5th at 11.15 Texas time, <laughs> Apple is... Uh about to, I believe, go on stage in in 45 minutes to announce what many uh, predict will be their virtual headset and potentially some other unknown thing. So to be determined. I feel like this could be another potentially massive ground shift. I'm not overhyped about it like in um it's like I, I feel like in this moment i have the appropriate amount of uh, maybe excitement but but caution but i think what this signifies is that as someone who has studied the metaverse and all of the challenges all of the built-in structural problems that are, are part of building this alternate digital world for humanity. Seeing Facebook struggle, I think mightily, it's why their stock was cut massively at the time when they were investing all their resources into it. It seems like this might be the moment where the metaverse makes a comeback as an actual possibility. And the reason I say that, Luke, is because as someone who has studied Apple for a long, long time, they are known for not necessarily inventing the thing, but making the thing that had already been invented that much better that it's basically a, a brand new thing by virtue of the increase in quality. And if I think of Metaverse's headset, which I've played with, the first time I put on the Oculus and played the golf game and whatever, I was wowed. I really was. It's like, oh my God, this is amazing, like 3D stuff. But but at the same time, the clunkiness of the thing, there were many ways in which I was also not a fanboy enough. I have very high confidence that Apple 
because it's in their DNA and they've been working on this over a decade, right? Behind closed doors in secrecy. If I were a betting man, which I am, I would say that the thing they announced today will almost like prove that the metaverse can be a viable thing. It's not going to be the solution, right? But uh, meaning not all the problems will be solved. But look, this isn't as n- insane a thing as as it is before the announcement today. I agree with all of that. I'm kind of watching from the sidelines. Like I used to be an Apple shareholder. I exited that to my chagrin like a decade ago. If anybody can get this right, it is Apple. Um, you know, as you say, Zuckerberg and Meta have sunk countless tens of billions of dollars of into R and D and trying to trying to sort of build uh, momentum around the metaverse and their own headsets. But they're still very clunky, even in the most recent iterations. I haven't used one, but reading reviews, like if Apple can shrink this stuff down to like ski goggles and make them comfortable. But probably the thing that's the bigger barrier is like the cultural change. Like we're, we're all kind of used to getting on Zoom and chatting to each other, like a little 2D person on a screen. Um, th- there is something, I think, in like the future of human communication online being a much more Im- immersive kind of, you know, 3D visceral experience. Because when I use VR, I don't feel like I've like played a game or, you know, d- you know, done some sort of experience. I feel like I've been somewhere. Like it feels like real, mm. even though it's clunky as heck. If any company can refine that and make it something that's really appealing and get people using it in real use cases, well, it's Apple and their legion of uh, fanboys and girls. Remember AirPods when they first came mm-hmm. out? As an early adopter, I remember there was a social stigma to some extent because they they look funny, white things coming out of your ears, right? Uh, and yet, Apple has the power, the cultural power, and forgive me for getting a little philosophical, but sometimes uh, Heidegger would say that there's this concept of, he uses the term worlding, where where the world in which you are immersed defines the things that are possible. And so it's not just like a, a fad, but all of a sudden um, it just makes more sense to do things in a certain way. And we know Apple has that power. So it did not take long for the AirPods to lose their stigma and become cool to whatever extent they became cool. Right now we know AirPods are a massive source of revenue and they further changed the game. That's, I think, the bet I would make pre-Apple announcement, that they're going to do it again and they're going to do it in a way that is and is not obvious. And they're going to almost like forcefully will the world toward taking the metaverse seriously. And if I can't wait to have this conversation with you two weeks from now after we see what they announced and, you know, our revised take on what we saw, what was what was revealed. But going into it, I'm I'm putting my money on Apple as, as a as a good bet. Yeah, I think I'll buy that. The thing I'm most excited about, I think, is not virtual reality. It's augmented reality or extended reality. Like if you could wear something, ultimately, you know, contact lenses, but there's going to be many like much clunkier iterations of hardware before then. But if you could wear something that kind of overlays like virtual information on the real world, that's literally going to change the way we all live, work, interact. That's going to change everything. Um, So VR, I feel like, is a bit of a kind of hokey step towards that. So it'd be interesting to see if they predominantly come up with like a VR product or an AR augmented reality product. But if they're taking a step in that direction, um, that'll be incredibly exciting, I think. And as with Apple, last thing to, to note is they do have a history of creating a thing that did not exist before, but after its announcement, the world fundamentally changes. So this is one of those moments where I don't know what the probability is of this happening again, but it's not zero. 
And so I can't wait to see what what, what we see in 45 minutes. Cool. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I haven't been watching this so, so hard, but actually maybe I will now. We need to wrap up the recording <laughs> so I can go tune in <laughs> and then sit right, the so, button on my Apple stock. <laughs> So uh, you were ditching the uh, three conversations game because you're going to torment me in a brand new, brand new way, right? Is that right? I am. Actually, before, do you mind if I answer a quick Twitter question, though, before we wrap oh, yeah, up of with a bit of fun and games? Yeah. So um, uh, one of our Twitter followers, Ben Flynn, asked quite an interesting question just in the DMs the other day. And like, my DMs are open. Got a question? Kind of fire away. Uh, just don't send me your only fans. I seem to be getting a lot of those at the moment. I've got no idea why. <laughs> you can send me your only fans. <laughs> I might even pay for it. <laughs> so, uh, what was Ben's question? It was basically along the lines of like, he's coming up to retirement. Like, what sort of things should he think about? How should he prepare for it? And kind of what did I do? So, I would say like the traditional retirement route is to build like an income portfolio, have like a bunch of dividend paying stocks. One of my very close friends uh, has done exactly this and he kind of lives his life. Now he pays his monthly bills with his uh, dividend income. That is not the only way to uh, run a portfolio in retirement. I'm doing it rather differently. Um, so I'm doing it just with a cash allocation. I think this is worth thinking about uh, really at any point in your investing lifetime, but particularly kind of towards the end when you're not adding new money to your portfolio you know like a chunk of your paycheck you're either you know getting ready to uh, live in it or you actually are living on it so i'm now you know withdrawing every month to fund my antics um like you can do that by holding a cash allocation so i've i've got about 10 percent of my portfolio literally in cash like some portion of that actually is in the uk equivalent of treasuries because I but I, but they're relatively short dated like six months out um and the benefit of having that cash is I can pay myself very easily but it has this sort of also benefit of uh it's easy for me to buy something without having to sell something first because I'm not adding new money anymore so if I want to buy something I need like a buffer to be able to do that um and then maybe the other thing I've done as I've got uh like older and grayer is um, I've, I'm recognizing like the damage that emotions can do to my kind of investment decision making. And I think we've actually covered it already in this episode, that whole thing about minimizing future regret. So I definitely have like a bunch of core components in my portfolio, probably, you know, 80% of my invested assets are in no more than about 10 companies, but I got a whole bunch like 20 or 30, I consider them venture investments all small positions, like half a percent, one percent positions, because I, you know, no one knows anything. I don't, I can tell you which way the market's going to go tomorrow, next year, or in 10 years time. I'm just kind of, you know, I've got my risk-based views on what's going to happen. Um, by having lots of smaller positions, I can, I feel like I can run a growth portfolio, but still um, use that kind of diversity to manage volatility. And by having like the majority of my money in the stuff I really, really believe in and making sure they are well diversified across different industries, um, I'm hoping to kind of manage the risk, but benefit from kind of long term returns mm -hmm. and upside kind of manage my exposure. Listen to what Luke is telling you. He's he's living the life uh, and <laughs> he he's done it over a long period of time and uh, it works. So not a theory Do do as he says and look don't uh uh you know i've been very lucky i think to get to this position to be able to retire in my late 40s but um uh you know it was decisions i took 20 years ago that set me up for that so if you haven't started investing and you're curious and you're listening to this pod and probably many other pods that are far more informative i'm sure like just get started with a smaller of money money you don't expect to need in the next five years ten years you know pay yourself first start investing from your paycheck and the first money that goes out should be going into your ideally tax efficient investment account and very small amounts of money can turn into very large amounts of money if you give time it's opportunity to kind of work its magic and there's more and more brokerages that allow partial shares yep. so there's no reason to put put limits that are arbitrary on your investment if you're if you're still 24 years old not making a lot of money 
the principle remains the same. You can save $20 per month, and that $20 could buy you a partial share of Tesla. Just start the process. It's the habit. It's developing the habit that will end up will help you end up in a hammock in Thailand in uh, yeah. when you're in your your early forties. Okay. If you take Luke's advice, yeah. Alrighty. So should we uh, should we wrap up today's episode with a a bit of a different game? We used to play the three conversations game. I'm going to spring this one on Christoph. He doesn't know this is coming, but we're going to play two truths and a lie familiar with the concept Uh i'm going to give you three facts uh and they're going to be oriented to today's discussion i'm going to give you three facts about nvidia and Uh one of them is going to be completely made up or mostly made up and you've got to pick out the 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 dodgy idea okay i'm on it here you go right number one nvidia fact the company has almost gone bankrupt several times Founded in 1993, and when it released its first chip in 95, that was a $10 million failure. Uh, they'd only been around for two years, and they had to lay off half of their 80 employees to stay afloat. My fact number two, the company name NVIDIA is an acronym that stands for New Vision in Digital Applications, reflecting the company's mission to drive a new era in computing technology. And fact number three, NVIDIA revolutionized gaming in 1999 with the release of the GeForce GPU. They actually couldn't decide what to name the product, so they had a contest with their customers. Uh, They got over 12,000 entries, and one of those was GeForce, so that became the official name for the release. Okay, I'm pretty confident I know this one, Uh, although sadly I can't remember what NVIDIA's... uh, actual name means oh wait i think it came back to me but the false false fact is number two and nvidia actually means something like the next uh the next iteration or the the uh uh help me out am i right well let's see let's see so uh i see you chose number two you didn't choose number one and you were correct to not do that. Number one is a fact. They did nearly go bankrupt mm-hmm. multiple times. Mm-hmm. And the failure of the NV1, their first ship, nearly wiped them out. Um, and I think they got thrown a lifeline by uh, Sega, the games company, to help them stay afloat for enough time to bring a profitable product to market. Um, you thought number two was the pork pie, the acronym for the name. You are exactly correct. Well done. Uh, the, the, the truth is stranger than fiction. Apparently, I didn't know this. NVIDIA's name is chosen because it represented envy and video. And uh, the the NV in the name stands for next version, which is how they viewed their company in the tech world. That kind of envy, uh, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. quite an interesting paradigm to build their thing on. And then, uh, and then, yeah, so clearly number three was also true. They had a contest to come up with the GE force. Apparently one of their users came up with the idea of geometry force. Um, and then that became the GE force line of graphics cards that NVIDIA are famous for. So well done. One point to Christoph. Awesome. Yeah. No, I know, I know this company well. So, uh, shout out to the is it acquired podcast they did a two part two or three part long 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 story historical deep dive into this company and so fascinating fascinating story congratulations to all the nvidia shareholders and may the forces be with all of you going <laughs> going forward <laughs> Yo, my yoda t-shirt is uh wishing you the, the, the greatest force uh for your future holding of nvidia if that's the decision right. You take. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right luke it was great catching up with you finally let's see sure. what what the world shows us in two weeks time let's do it and uh we went deeper on nvidia today if there's a company you're interested in, you think we should go explore and maybe chat about in a future episode, well, drop us a note on Twitter and let us know. We're always happy to debate. You can find me at 7 Luke Hallard. And I am at 7 Flying Platypus.
And if you want to see our deep dives or you want to see Christoph getting a grilling from Anaban or really, you know, any of the 200 plus fantastic stock recommendations, many of which have doubled in the last couple of months, go check out seveninvesting.com slash subscribe. And if you get in this month, you're going to get that for one US dollar only. I can't think of a better deal right now. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs>